All right, we're going to take a little look at uh, gravity and orbits. Uh, specifically, we're going to take a look at Newton's version of uh, gravity. Uh, so no general relativity today. Um, gravity is pretty strange. Uh, if you have any two objects, so we'll call one mass one and one mass two. Any two objects, uh, put them near each other. There's a teeny tiny attraction between these two masses. So anything that has uh, mass will they'll pull toward each other um, with what I'm going to call F grav, gravitational force, equal and opposite. So um, it doesn't matter like if these things are two different, uh, different masses, um, they actually pull equally on each other, okay? It's just for every action, there's equal opposite uh, reaction. So the Earth pulls on you with your own weight, um, and you pull on the Earth with exactly your weight also. Um, and so that's what's going on here, equal and opposite force. So don't be faked out if you're given a situation where masses are actually different. Um, so what Newton figured out was not really much anything about how it worked, but he figured out how strong the force is. Um, and so uh, it works like this. So Newton's law of gravitation looks like this. Uh, there's a constant that we're going to talk about in a minute. And then it depends on the two masses. So if either of the two masses gets bigger, then, then the force goes up. Um, and then divided by the distance between them squared, right? So R will be the distance between these guys. So there's R, the distance between. So it goes like this. Um, we can play around with this constant here to see what its uh, units would be. Um, well, first, let's, I'll give you its value. Um, in standard uh, uh, SI units, or it's 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, very tiny. And then let's just cobble together the stand, what the standard units would be. Uh, well, you know that ultimately you just got to end up with Newtons over here. Um, so this thing, let's just start it off with having Newtons inside of it. So it's got Newtons. And then what we need to do is cancel out these two kilograms that are coming up, right? Kilograms times kilograms. So there must be a kilogram squared like in the denominator of this thing. Um, which I'll leave this blank. So we'll say that's kilograms, that's kilograms. And then this is going to be like a distance squared, meter squared. Well, so what that means is if we're dividing by a uh, meter squared, we need to have a meter squared in the numerator of this thing. So this will be the units. Um, this is called the gravitation constant. The, the take-home message here is that this, this gravitational constant is small. Um, and so you need the entire Earth to pull on you, the mass of the entire Earth to pull on you to generate your piddly little weight worth of uh, gravitational force, right? So if you have two people in a room, they don't pull on, on each other very hard. Um, so an easy way to kind of see how this plays out is if you think of two um, one kilogram masses that are a meter apart. Um, so let's have these guys separated by one meter. You can see the gravitational attraction from these things will just be this number times one times one divided by one squared. So it, it would be this many Newtons. So if you have a kilogram and a kilogram, they only attract with uh, 6.67 times 10 to minus 11 Newtons. Um, so really weak attraction between um, sort of normal objects that we might screw around with. Uh, so that's Newton's law of gravity. Um, that's the magnitude, gives you the strength, um, and always attractive. The direction, the, there's no mechanism by which gravity repels things. Um, well, so let's play around with this a little bit. Um, so here's the Earth, and let's suppose you're kind of like near the surface of the Earth in free fall. Um, so not to scale, uh, but here's you. And by the way, very much not to scale, because if you were to draw um, the altitude like where our space station orbits, like around the Earth, and kind of draw it to scale, uh, believe it or not, the space station's only about like maybe... Uh, there, where I'm putting that little dot. Um, so the space station, uh, the people on the space station are only like 3-4% like farther from the center of the Earth than you are right now. Uh, so very much not to scale. Um, but let's draw a picture of, here's you, say, in free fall, and then you falling toward the Earth, why there would be this F-grav acting upon you. Okay. Well, so let's figure out how strong the gravitational force is on you. So here's you. And then here's the Earth. So the gravitational force upon you. Well, let's just use the relationship. 
Uh, I'll just rewrite it for now, g m1 m2 over r squared. Right, well, so let's, let's put in what we've got here. We have the constant g, we have the mass of the earth, um, and then we would have the mass of u, and then divided by, now this is interesting. Um, here's the, the earth, and then here's where you are. Um, so to decide which uh, distance we should use. This actually is an interesting thing because, right, there's little chunks of the earth here that are pulling you, say, this way. And, but for every one of those, there's a little chunk here pulling you that way. And then there's a chunk way out here that's not so important because it's so far away, but it still pulls on you like a little bit toward it. And for every one of those, there's one here. Now it turns out, and I'm not going to prove it here, um, but it turns out that if you add up all those little pulls, um, very nice, uh, uh, kind of almost miraculous, okay? It turns out that if you, if you sum over all those little poles, it turns out you can treat the Earth, a, a, a spherical object, as though all the mass is actually concentrated at the center here. Um, so in other words, the gravitational attraction between you and the Earth, assuming the Earth is like a perfect sphere, okay, which I know we know it's not perfect, but uh, for our purposes, good enough, if you shrunk the Earth down to just a little point uh, here, the gravitational force on you would be basically be the same between you and that point as between you and the Earth blown up to its uh, current size. Okay, so as it turns out, then the distance that you can use if you have a like spherical object is you can go between uh, object one and the center of the other object. So um, this is going to be um, actually then the radius of the Earth squared. So here's the gravitational force between uh, you and the Earth. Now you may know from uh, your freshman physics, if you're near the surface of the Earth, the force of gravity on you, your, your weight is just your mass times little g, uh, m times little g. Okay, and so what's, what that means then is if you look at these numbers here, and I can give you some data for this, so G itself is this 6.67 times 10 to minus 11, um, what was it again, Newton's meter squared over kilogram squared. Um, and then mass of the Earth, let me give you that. Um, it's like 5.97 times 10 to the 24th uh, kilos, uh, pretty healthy, quite a few kilos. Uh, and then the radius of the Earth in meters is like 6.37 uh, times 10 to 6 meters. So it turns out if you plug these three things into there and calculate away, um, what's kind of neat is if you calculate that, you'll get like 9.81. Um, you can either think of the units as being newtons per kilogram or just meters per second squared. You'll recognize that number. Um, so the reason the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the Earth is the value that it is, is because the Earth has a particular mass and a particular radius. So if you go to another planet with a different mass and different radius, you can get a different um, value of G at the surface. Um, so that's, you can think of it as being kind of, that's where that uh, number comes from. Uh, incidentally, on the moon, it's, it's about a sixth uh, at the surface of the moon. It's about a sixth uh, uh, what it is on Earth. Um, so there is Newton's law of gravity acting with, on, on you, kind of uh, at this point falling towards the Earth. Now you pull e with an equal and opposite force on the Earth, um, but you just putting a few hundred Newtons on the Earth, um, you're not going to uh, accelerate it very much. Okay. Um, so there's Newton's law of gravity applied to you near the um, surface of the Earth. So the next little thing that we'll look at is if you actually put something into orbit around the Earth. Um, so the particular thing that we're going to, um, well, we'll just Im imagine a satellite that's, um, that's outgoing around the Earth. And so say that we've, we've shot something into a circular orbit. Um, so let me get rid of this picture. Okay, so now we're going to stick a, a satellite up here. So I'm going to call it uh, M with a little S for a satellite. So the satellite's up here. Could be the moon, could be the space station, um, and it's jamming around. Right, so this thing's up in, up in orbit, going around the, uh, in a circular orbit, let's say. So it's going to have the, uh, an orbit of some radius. Okay. Um, by the way, don't think of this as the 
Um, you can apply the math we're about to do to the Earth and the Moon, but as far as a picture, this is a terrible picture of the Earth and the Moon. Um, nowhere near to scale. Um, if I were drawing, since I've drawn the Earth this big, if I wanted to draw the, the Moon, I would have to draw something about this big as the Moon, and I would have to put it way outside of this classroom. Um, so the distance between the Earth and Moon, like to scale, if that's the Earth, the Moon the moon's like way out here and, and like that big. Uh, okay, so so your science teachers are often guilty of drawing these pictures that are a little bit misleading about the, the moon and the earth system. But let's just take this to be a, some generic satellite, okay, that's going around. And so what we're gonna do is um, learn something about how it moves. And so what we wanna do is, so here's the arrow I drew, here's the direction of its velocity, let's say. Well, so what we want to do to learn how things move, as usual in your physics courses, is you, you'll look at F equals MA, or this object going around. Well, so what we want to do is draw the force, force on that object. Well, the only force is this one, is F grav. Right? Velocity is not a force, so maybe let's make sure that's not like attached on there. So this is it. You know, when you, when you first see it, it's like, well, why doesn't it just fall down? Well, it's moving sideways too fast. So it kind of, it is falling, but the Earth's just continuously pulling it toward the Earth. Um, well, so let's do F equals MA. Well, so our force, our only force acting on it is F grav equals M. Now, if this thing is cruising around in a circle here at a constant speed in a circular orbit, this acceleration is going to be the centripetal acceleration V squared over R. So maybe I'll put that in parentheses, that what we've done here is we've substituted the centripetal acceleration. Um, and which mass would this be? Well, we're talking about the motion of the satellite right now. So this would be ms. Now let's write down what the gravitational force is. So that's going to be big G times mass of the Earth, mass of the satellite, divided by the radius of the orbit squared, um, equals uh, mass of the satellite, v squared, divided by the radius of the orbit. What you notice right away is that the mass of the satellite cancels out. So that's important because what it means is you can put a space station in orbit at that place, or if you wanted to put a paperclip in orbit at that place, they'd have the same um, velocity to orbit with that particular circular um, uh, radius. So what you end up noticing here is we basically have an expression, if we bring the r over to the other side, is we have an expression that relates the radius of the orbit um, to a particular speed. I'm just going to leave it in terms of v squared because you can know how to take the square root of both sides. So what's important about this is given a particular radius at which you want a circular orbit, you have to go at a certain speed to be at that orbit. If you change the speed, you're not going to be orbiting at that, um, at that particular radius, okay? Um, so you, if you want to orbit in a particular place, there's a very particular speed you need to go to be at that, um, at that place. Um, what we'll do in a moment, or we, we might as well do it now, is figure out what that um, parameter would be, say, for the moon. Um, so if we let the satellite be the moon, so just a little bit of data here. So R for the or, um, Earth to moon, uh, E-A-R-T-H. Um, the, the radius of that orbit is, what do I get? 3.85 times 10 to the eighth. And uh, um, the mass of the, oh, we don't need the mass of the moon at the moment. The mass of the Earth is about, well, we did this already. It's like 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilos. That's meters, by the way. Um, so let's, let's put that in there and figure out how fast the moon goes when it's, when it's in its orbit. Um, so for example, if we look at the, for the moon, um, we do 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 times the mass of the Earth at 5.97 times 10 to the 24th um, divided by the radius of that orbit, which is 3.85 times 10 to the 8th. Um, that equals v squared. So we're going to have to remember to take the uh, square. All right, so it turns out when you do this, you'll get a velocity of um, 1,016 meters per second. Um, so just to get a, oh, I guess I would round up to 1,017. If you, um, just to get a rough idea of what that is, I mean, that's, that's pretty fast. And, and 
uh, over a little over a kilometer uh, every second. If you divide that number by about 343, that would give you about how many times the speed of sound on Earth that is. Um, so it's it's very close to uh, it's uh, Mach 3. So it's like Mach 2.97. So I'm going to put it like this. It's about um, equivalent to Mach 3 for th something traveling at, on, on Earth. Um, so three, about, about three times the speed of sound on Earth. So moon's jamming right along uh, uh, as it cruises its way around. Uh, but it's got a long way to go. Um, so as you know, it should take about a month to go around. But what we can do now is figure out exactly how long it takes to, uh, to go around um, using now that we know its velocity. Um, so what I'm going to do is go back up here to our expression for the velocity. And what we're going to do is relate um, this expression to how long it takes to go around the um, around in its circular orbit. Well, velocity, as you know, is distance per time. And so what we can do is we can say, well, substituting for v, what I'm going to do is say, well, what distance do I go? Well, I go in orbit, 2 pi r. And what time is relevant for that orbit? Well, that would be the special time called t, or the period um, of that orbit. So this would be the time to complete one orbit. So what we're about to do now then is we have these two things being equal. So now what we're about to do is be able to relate the, ra the uh, radius of the orbit to the time it takes to complete an orbit. Um, so just to clean this up a little bit, I'm going to get rid of this. Um, we'll just neaten this up a little bit. So what I want to do is relate t and r. Um, so what I'm going to do is, let, let me just rewrite one line of algebra then to make it easier to follow. So we have GME over R equals, and then this is going to be 4 pi squared R squared over T squared. And so what you can then do is let's just solve for the period, okay? In fact, what I'm going to do to keep it neat and clean is I'm going to solve for T squared. So bring the T squared over here and bring everything else on the other side. So you get 4 pi squared over g m e, that's a g, not a 6, uh, 4 pi squared over g m e, and then r cubed. So what this expression does is it relates the, well, the square of the orbital period to the cube of the radius. Now, curiously enough, this uh, was noticed in the time of Kepler that from painstaking observations of, of orbits, that the, um, the square of the period was proportional to the cube of the orbital radius, but they didn't know why. Um, and so then uh, after Newton came along, we were able to derive why this is the case, right? So um, it's the property of planetary motion that the square of the period is proportional to or goes like the cube of the radius. And so what we can do is just plug some numbers in to see what the um, period of rotation of the moon is. Um, and so we can we can just plug in the data kind of that we already have. Um, so we have four. Whoops, p squared is going to be four pi squared over. And then let's just plug the numbers in. Six point six seven. That's ten to minus eleven. Uh, mass of the Earth is five point nine seven times ten to the twenty-four uh, kilograms. And then we have to plug in the orbital radius cubed. Three point eight five times ten to the eight. And we have to cube it, right? Now notice when a couple things. So at, when you punch that into the calculator, um, notice that you will um, you're going to be solving for t squared. So you're going to have to take the square root of it to get the final answer. And then the other thing to notice is the period that's going to be spat out of that is going to be in seconds. Um, so you're going to get a certain number of seconds once you um, once you grind through all of that. All right. So when you plug all those numbers in, you, and don't forget to take the square root when you finish. Um, you'll get uh, 2.38 times 10 to the 6 seconds. Um, hard for me to picture that number of uh, 2.38 million uh, seconds. And so what we want to do is divide by um, uh, 24 um, and then divide by 3,600. to get the number of days that it's going to take. So when we do that, you get 27.53 days.
which as you know for the moon, well, it takes about a month for the, for the moon to go, uh, go around the Earth. Um, so there with a quick kind of you know, two-liner calculation, um, you can figure out um, how long it takes for something orbiting at a particular, um, at a particular altitude to, uh, to go. What you'll find if you do the same thing for the space shuttle, say where it used to orbit, or the International Space Station, um, it will orbit about every 90 minutes. It's actually much, much closer. So while the moon's way out there taking a month to go around, um, the, the International Space Station is like somewhere here um, and taking only about a, an hour and a half to go around. Um, as, you, as you find if you orbit right at the Earth's surface, like at the, at the treetops, uh, kind of dangerous. Um, but you could, uh, it, it's a little bit under an hour and a half for the um, uh, uh, orbital period at that altitude.